was a time that one of his political opponents was so popular and people wanted to vote for that man, he was poisoned. And that resulted in a near coup experience. People, people went violent, people were angry with him, and that was in the 70s. And when you see a man that has a bad health and is still insisting that he must rule, then that is the height of greediness. That is the height of avarice. That is the height of wickedness. Because I will tell you the simple truth. Nobody with a poor health will give you a healthy leadership. Why do we have people who come to power and they don't want to go, they want to die in power, they want to mess up the seat before they leave? When you don't like a person to rule you and he forces himself on you, anytime you see him anywhere, you will feel sad. You will not like him. Even if he talks, he, he might not even ring. Even if he's saying the right thing, if he, if he ring like the wrong.
The next day, Monday, June 8, both the Spanish Foreign Affairs Ministry and some selected international journalists like the BBC and Co. supported Jean Eyegen Dong in his spirited diplomatic lies. They tried to make it look like what he was saying is real, that the president was okay, the president was alive, because that was the only news that he felt with Ginga, a lot of people. And in most cases, majority of people even want him to pass away because he has already overstayed his welcome. But the lies were too watery to stay long, as official state media in Barcelona and other global media outlets later broke the news that indeed His Excellency Omar Bongo Dimba is dead. He suffered an attack around 12 GMT at Quiron Clinic, Barcelona, and died. In Young, who had created what appeared like a web of deliberate lies, later called the press and broke the sad news to them. He confirmed that his principal died of heart attack. The same prime minister that was playing double game with diplomatic lies and all sorts of assorted facade <laughs> was the one that came out to say, please, I'm sorry, Mr. President passed away. He died of heart attack. But 24 hours ago, he was telling the country that they were with him. He was in a good shape and all that. Meanwhile, the president was half gone. So what happened? Omar Bongo's rise to power, short lead. We want to let you know. Well. Thursday, June 11, Bongo's body was flown into Brazzaville from Barcelona. You know, he left on May 7. It was a Thursday of year 2009, and he was flown back into Brazzaville, no, Libreville, on May 11, on a Thursday again. And it was his body was given a five day open display at the presidential villa adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean before a state funeral was done in honor of Omar Bongo. Well, let's look at his looting profile. This is not the whole story of Omar Bongo. This is just a short snippet, you know, of his profile. Omar Bongo's journey into politics was a zigzag rise from nothing to something until political greed for power allegedly overwhelmed him. Bongo started his political career in 1962 as an official of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In March 1962, he became assistant director of the presidential cabinet office. In 1962, he became assistant director of the presidential cabinet office and became full director seven months later. Before then, he started with the public service as an official of the Post and Telecoms before he left to join the military where he served as a second lieutenant in the army and, and later as the first lieutenant in the Air Force in Brazzaville. Banqui and, and, and he operated in Brazzaville, in Banqui and Fort Lamy, now known as Njadema Chad. He was later discharged honorably as a captain. He was, dis, he was discharged honorably as a captain in the Air Force. So he had a little bit of military training before going fully into politics. So, not to waste time, Omar Bongo was a man eager for the good things of life. He started so much early, he worked in the post and telecoms, and when he didn't see anything good, he joined the army, he served as a second lieutenant, then he joined the Air Force, you know, he, he joined the Air Force, and later served as his first lieutenant before he was honorably discharged and he went straight into the civil service. In 1964, during the first coup attempt in the 20th century Gabon, President Leon Imba, that was the president, that was the, I think that was the first president and he was one of those who really started the democratic lines in Gabon. We'll talk about him later. President Leon Ba was kidnapped and Bongo himself held in a military detention in Libreville for just two days. It was a coup attempt, but French was able to move in to save Leon Ba from his captors. And he was set to freedom and uh, Bongo too was set to freedom. French would have moved in and restored the government of Mba, Bongo's boss, and Bongo was equally set free. His rise came in 1965 as he was, as he was appointed as a presidential representative and placed in charge of defense and coordination. He was placed in charge of defense and coordination of the country. He later became a minister of information and tourism.
first on interim basis and later substantive minister. His boss, Leo Mba, whose health was far deteriorating, later appointed him vice president of Gabon on November 12, 1966. Mba was re-elected president in March 1967, and since Bongo has tasted power as acting president when Mba suffered illness in November of the previous year, it was easy for him to carry along with his boss. Bongo became the president of the Republic of Gabon in December 2, 1967, after the death of his boss, Leo Mba, on November 28, 1966. Bongo was 32 years old when he came to power, and he was the fourth youngest third world leader after Captain Michael Mikombero of Burundi and Sergeant Nasingbe Eyadema of Togo. Remember? Papa Eyadema. Those are young, young guys in those days. Maybe if Umar Bongo didn't leave the army or the air force, he would have also done a coup because he was too ambitious. And you know, he's a man of, he's a man of short height. I'm not, I'm saying this, I'm saying this without prejudice. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to look at some of the, the features of people like that. They're always very power conscious and power conscientious and all that. So he, leaving, the military might just be a coincidence. Maybe if he had stayed long, he would have done the same thing like Sergeant Nasingbe Adema, who eventually became a long ruling political strongman in Togo. And when he was dying, his son took over, and his son is still in Togo. He's still ruling in Togo, except something new happened tomorrow morning. Now, in March 1968, Bongo decreed Gabon to be a one party state. And that was the beginning of his four decades of political crisis, which resulted in near coup experiences, political upheavals, and more. Because there was, it was, a, there was age of reason at that time, and there was political awareness. So he decided to turn the state to a one-party state so that he can have his firm grip and continue ruling. But different political over took place. In fact, there was a time that one of his political opponents was so popular, and people wanted to vote for that man. He was poisoned. And that resulted in a near coup experience. People, people went violent. People were angry with him. And that was in the 70s. We are coming there. Uh, you find out that in a lot of other histories about El Haj Omar Bongo Dimba. He was a great puppet of the French political system and he served France to the later. He emerged himself in few financial, political, and diplomatic crises here and there. For instance, Omar Bongo was famous for saying, Gabon without France is like a car with no driver. French without Gabon is like a car with no foil. Omar Bongo used to say that Gabon without France is like a car with no foil. And that the French without Gabon is like a car with no driver. That was his philosophy and his famous saying. So he was entrenched in the political intrigues of French and he was one of the greatest promoters of the colonial uh, the colonial economy of the French people. He was their puppet, so he protected their business under what we call economic protectionism. This famous saying goes a very long way to express how deep, how far, and how tremendous Omar Bongo's relationship with the French people and France political authorities flew in his rainy years. On his part, he single-handedly influenced the sacking of several French diplomats as a result of disagreements over short-lived short-lived policies and monetary issues. He was a businessman and Gabon oil was under his influence, 100%. He used that oil power to negotiate a lot of political deals, home and abroad. He was richly corrupt and controversial in many ways. His biggest act of greed was his double roles as president and minister of several other departments. Omar Bongo was so corrupt to the extent that he was even paying himself salary for other roles. He was the president and he was minister at the same time. And he was not just minister in one department, he was minister in triple, several departments. Imagine someone in Abuja now make himself the president of Nigeria and he's also minister of petroleum and he makes the Minister of National Planning, and he makes the Minister of Defense, he makes the Minister of, uh, uh, of what again, of Commerce and Industry. So you can look at the level of the greed 
of Danku Omar Bongo. Hey, look at him, he was so greedy with power. So you see, he won't even allow the position of a vice president to be shared in his cabinet, but will rather consign his vice president to his peer rule, his peer rule of prime minister. Why he had both the post of president and commander in chief, plus minister of defense, which is 1967 to 1981, minister of national planning from 1967 to 1977, prime minister, he was also prime minister at the time, from 1967 to 1975, he was president, prime minister. He, 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 he unbundled the office of vice president. So in 1975, he later gave the position of prime minister to his former vice president, Leon Mebiame, after years of leaving the later to be politically redundant. He, he, he was prime minister too, president, prime minister. So you, 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 you look at his character, you look at the greed in their family. Babani president, Omoni Yaloja, or Babaloja, or in charge of advertising, you see, or Komondo in charge of telecoms, you know, all sort of, they, they, they use their political position to siphon a lot of rich portfolios in the government. Now, he was also interior minister from 1967 to 1970 until a political consensus happened in 1979 after a congress in Gabon, which stopped the president from dominating the political space and equally restored the country to a multi-party state. And even at that, Obama Bongo didn't allow opposition to win him for the next three decades. There was a kind of crisis in the parliament that no, you can't do this, you can't continue like this. Why should you be you alone? You are doing this. You are doing this. So a lot of intellectuals came together and they did a law that no, you can't be this. It's either you are a president and you're a president for life, and you're a president for it, not for life. You can't be president, minister of interior, minister of national planning, prime minister, minister of oil and gas, all sort of assorted rules for yourself. And you make your daughter or your son this and that and that. It's still happening in Nigeria. It's happening everywhere in Africa. A president wants his daughter to be in charge of the markets and collect levies on behalf of the family. A president wants his son to be in charge of outdoor advertising and some other sensitive economic gaining portfolios in the country. A president wants his family to hold on to uh, strategic roles that brings money to the family. He wants to be making money per second, even though his health might not even permit, but he just wants to sit on that seat. Now look at Bongo. You know, he was also interior minister from 1970 to 1970 until a political consensus happened after the 1979 Congress in Gabon, which stopped him from dominating the political space and equally returned equally returned the country to a multi-party state. And even at that, Omar Bongo didn't allow opposition to win him for the next three decades. The, the one with potential to oust him were either killed via food poison or jailed or hauled into asylum. He loved to have everything to himself and everything he had till 2009 when death took everything from him, including his wife. Omabongo ruled with a very strong hand. He had everything to himself. But in 2009, death took everything away from him, first taking his wife before taking him. Even at his death, the country couldn't witness true democracy as his once upon a time DJ son, <laughs> DJ musician son. Ali or Ali Bongo was drafted in to become president and commander in chief until he too was dealt a severe stroke that left him in a vegetable state in early year 2018. His son that was a musician, he was the one that called the boy that why are you doing music? You better come into government. You can look at it even in a big church in Nigeria, the head of the church, a church that he inherited from another person. And it's your long way. He inherited the church from Another person, he did it in a way that all his children are now holding pivotal rule in the church. To the extent that he put his first son in the ladder, leadership ladder. The boy was rising, the boy was rising, and he was wishing that one day, if he passes away, that boy can become the next head of the church. God forgive me, on the, on, until the, 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 the guy passed away two years ago in his sleep. Is it two years ago or three years ago? That is the kind of chemistry. That is the kind of urge that a black man find himself in. That is what P.W. Botha was saying, that everything you give them, they use it to benefit themselves, they use it to promote themselves, they use it to hijack power, to hijack money. 
they ethnicize it. Even this big church, you can imagine a big church like that, and it's the son of the, of the, of the, of the man that is the PA. And he was just putting his children in the leadership line so that if anything happens in the future, his children can just pop up and they will continue. The... When God didn't say so, the owner of the church passed away. His own children are not even in the cadre of leadership. And this same thing is what happened to the Bongo family in Gabon. The guy brought his son from music and drafted him into politics. And he went through, he was formerly, I think, a parliamentarian or something. He was in a position that warranted him to draw the position when they did the new law that anybody that is not up to 30 years age should not be in that position. So he went, then they brought him back as a minister of defense. <laughs> so he was minister of defense. So when his father died, it was easy for him to, to fly into the leadership, of position, uh, the leadership position of his father. Nobody objected. Everybody was like, Papa's son, Papa's son, Omo Baba, Omo Baba, Omo Baba, Omo Baba. When there are a lot of highly gifted intellectuals who could assume the role of president and take the country to El Dorado, he managed that stroke position till power was taken away from him last weekend, <laughs> August 30. Okay, now, before his demise, Bongo allegedly loved to sleep with both Italian and Parisian police. Okay, that's in the story, it's in the history, in the Anna. This, this is without prejudice. Anyway, that's what people are saying. This is according to what is found on the internet about him. You know, uh, in fact, Francis, uh, Francesco Smarto, he, an Italian fashion designer, admitted providing Bongo with prostitutes in order to secure him as a millionaire dollar fashion business. You know, there are a lot of allegations about him that everything is about money. Even a young fashion designer from Italy, Italian fashion designer, Francesco Smarto said that he had to supply him allegedly prostitutes for him to sign him for a multi-million dollar fashion business in Gabon. So that is how greedy they were in that family. Everything was monetized. Even the grace to be good was monetized. The grace to be kind was, even kindness was monetized. There are some things that as a leader, you just say, for my life, I not a deal. But they, they monetize everything. So you can see that the, the son, that's why Ali Bongo was shouting that their friends should make noise because there are a lot of people they gave power to in different countries, they gave them contracts. So they felt that those people would use their money and start creating chaos, making noise. What kind of noise is that? Anyway, we are still making noise for him now. So Bongo was one of the wealthiest African head of state in the world. His wealth attributed primarily to oil revenue and alleged corruption. In 2005, just four years to his death, an investigation by the United States Senate Subcommittee on, Investi on Investigation into Citibank in in Citibank's, Citibank's scandal estimated that the Gabonese president held $130 million in just one single account at the, banks, at the, at the Citibank. Money, the Senate report said, was sourced in the public finance of Gabon. He had one account alone, $130 million. There were many financial induced scandals as an analyst alleged he made his country and his oil industry available as a source of offshore slush fund to sponsor offshore political activities that benefited him in huge material and financial sources. He had several luxurious properties spread across the heart of Europe, like a mansion worth 50 million pounds in Paris' most expensive neighborhood. It's one of his territory properties allegedly scattered across the world. His Paris mansion is said to be near the Rue de la Boume, near the LC Palace, with several fleet of limousine, Maybach, and other expensive automobiles. The reign of his son, Ali, from August 2009 to August 2023, is a sign of their symbolic avarice, greed, and obnoxious sense of ownership of a country of several other people of high intellect, education, and association. They saw Gabon as their own property. In fact, to the extent that most analysts will be calling Gabon Bongo. And you can imagine that I myself, I've called it Bongo most of the time now, instead of calling it Gabon. So they, 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 they made the country, they, they, they spiritualize it. They just that country. So when you think of Gabon, you think of the Bongos. When you think of Gabon, you think of El Haj, Omar Bongo. You think of Gabon, you think of Ali Bongo. Now, what happened? Now, this is the most successful coup that stopped the 56 years of 
the Bongo dynasty. There's still more to say about Omar, Ali Bongo's father, and their family in days to come. Now, why we said all this story is just to illustrate. If you go on the internet, you'll find a lot about Omar Bongo, and you know what I'm talking about. So what I'm talking is this. Why should you hold on to power? Why do African leaders think that they can hold on to power, they can control the mind of the people, they can control the mood of the people? In 2007, we flew into, into Sierra Leone for the inauguration party of President NS Bai Kuruma. And from what we saw on the street of Freetown, there was so much animosity against the former outgoing president, Tejan Kaba. Why? For a lot of years, even when we went to the presidential villa to have our dinner, that was November 2007, I think November 14 or November 15, we had the presidential party with His Excellency NS Bai Kuruma at Siaka Stevie presidential villa in Freetown. You could hear how smelly some part of the villa was smelling. That is the, 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 the sewage. The sewage has not been packed in years. And from what we gathered, we learned that President Tejan Kaba couldn't live in the villa because he was afraid of coup. He had to go and be living on hilltop. <laughs> he had his own presidential villa on the hilltop. So anytime he's going, he used the helicopter to fly into Lungi Airport. Then he now take off to any part of the world. Then when he's coming, he flew into the airport, then the helicopter will fly him on hilltop. But thank God for Sierra Leone, that is just five, five years. Five, five years tenor. So he did 10 years and we were able to vote him out. Even his deputy, Solomon Barewa, at that time, you know what happened? The deputy was contesting, he wanted to survive, he wanted to, 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 to survive his presidency. And Tejan Kaba wanted him to survive him because it was going to be a continuation of illegitimacy. But look at what happened to Solomon's wife. Solomon's wife was sick, she was traveling abroad. From what we gathered in, in Freetown, she died on the plane. You see, when people are angry with you, when people don't like you, suddenly they will happen. Then what happened? It was Bai Kuruma, who was coming from the private sector, NS Bai Kuruma. He was an insurance broker, a new guy on the political scene that the people voted for. Of course, that election was not easy. There was a quagmire, there was a stalemate. But eventually, we thank God for the INEC in that country. They were able to do a rerun, and then as Bai Koroma won, the people also reacted because Solomon Balewa was the biggest contender. He was the vice president for 10 years under Tejan Kaba. That was what I knew about that political era in Sierra Leone. And thank God for stable democracy in Sierra Leone. Thank God for stable democracy in Ghana. Thank God for stable democracy in places like Botswana. Thank God for civil democracy in places like South Africa. But look at the bongo now. And the bongo is coming out to beg everybody to make a noise. What kind of noise are you going to make? What kind of noise do you want us to make? The only people that are going to make noise are maybe the goats, the sheep, and some other bunch of animals in the zoo. They are going to be around the making noise because nobody's going to make no reasonable human being, no rational human being with pity. Ali Bongo and his family. Even some people are saying, oh, the, the new head of the Juta is a cousin. Uh, the, 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 the new general. You know, that is a, is a cousin. People are making noise. People are saying, oh, I, don't, I don't care. The Yoruba will say, Eje kale akata lo, ka afabo, da e diye. Eje kale akata lo no, afabo be diye. So let's chase the real issue away. Either the new Juta head is a cousin, or he's a family member, he's a secondary, issue. We will face him. We will face him at the right time. We will talk to him. If there is no change in the political lifestyle of the Gabonese, if there is no change in the political and the business lifestyle of Gabonese, if it is going to be a continued lutrocracy, then people will react. If the people of Gabon, even in 2016, when Ali Bongo came back, and let's even go to Ali Bongo, the worst haste, the worst haste in history was Ali Bongo was hit by stroke in 2018, and they hid him for 10 months. People are asking, where's the president? Where's the president? It took him a long time before he could draft a letter to allow his deputy, the prime minister, to act in the presidential capacity because he was greedy. And when he came out, that whatever, that position of stroke, that, that ill health was visible. He couldn't work properly. 
In fact, there's a video where the French president, Emmanuel Macron, took him out of the car, guided him to the staircase, and when they were doing the photo op, he, he nearly fell. Macron had to hold him. And it's, it, it says a lot about the French democratic uh, establishment under Macron. Why will Macron admit that kind of a thing? Why will the French give us that kind of an aberration? Why? Why should we look at a sick person? A sick person will force himself on us and say he must rule us. And all of us are keeping quiet. All of us are like, ah, what can we do? Look at the Gabonese now. They've done something. Then you have stroke. For you to even come out and people see you that you are working, you are not stable, your, 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 your workings are not stable, you, 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 are, you are damaged already, you are half damaged. Then people are seeing you, that perception has registered in their mindset. Then the election came, you still want to force them to vote you. You want to change the electoral, electoral dynamic. You want to change it to favor yourself. When you know that there's another person, an opposition, who is capable, who is fit in his speech, in his walking, in his gait, yet you want to change the narrative and force them. You even went as bad, as horrible as closing down the internet. Omar Bongo is somebody that's supposed to be punched in the face, despite his heel hurt. He's supposed to be punched. He's not shouting that he need. He need punching on the face. He need to be punched and be spat on. Because you didn't do well. You, you mess with the mindset of the people. You mess with their emotional intelligence. And you think you are going to be president. They will allow you to come back. Even if the military didn't take power from you. What of the causes of the people? It is the cost, the, the, the cost of the mouth of the people that ran you into that stroke. If you look at it, your father did his birthday in 2016. He did his 70th birthday and his fifth time inauguration party. And three years later, his wife was first to go. Till today in Gabon, they don't know the sickness that killed the woman. It's just hearsay. This happened to her, that happened to her. She died a mysterious death at the age of 45. Then two months later, her husband also flew out of the country and he flew his dead body back. Is that not enough warnings, spiritual warning, that people don't want you in power? Then you came in, you, you struggled, you wriggled yourself into power. Then you started doing it. Then in 2018, after just two years after your second time, two years to do your second time in power, seven, seven years tenor, then you had a massive stroke. What would have taken you to say, oh, gentlemen, I'm stepping aside? Even in this third time that you want to go, what would have made you, common sense, would have told you Ali, Ali Bongo, or whatever you call yourself, it should have told you that you should have just stepped down and say, let the country have it the way they want it. Let the citizen have it. Why should you force yourself on people? Somebody is sick, he cannot stay two years, two, two hours, he cannot stay three hours in one place without being injected. He's, he's being managed. In, in most cases, they are even putting their pass to help him. His health is fragile. And you are still forcing yourself. <laughs> you tipati kuku, laughing fashion go. Then you force yourself on people. You didn't win an election, you just jam, jam pack yourself into power. And you say you are going to take the right decision. If the process that brought you to power is not right, your decisions, even if it is right, will not be right in the long run. Because people will remember the incident that brought you to power. People will always live with that pain. Majority. If majority are not happy that you are in power, majority are not happy that you call yourself their president, and they feel that they didn't vote you, they feel that they voted another person, and you are sitting on that seat. Nobody is going to be happy with you. People will be angry. People will be very, very, very angry with you. And in the case of Gabon, that will happen. Omar Bongo, the father, was greedy. Ali Bongo, the son, was double greedy. Even to the extent that his health was not enough to communicate to him. And when you see a man that has a bad health and is still insisting that he must rule, then that is the height of greediness. That is the height of avarice. That is the height of wickedness. Uh, because I will tell you the simple truth. Nobody with a poor health will give you a healthy leadership. Because everything is going to be on delegation. You will delegate to this, delegate to that, delegate to this, delegate to that. He will never be in his right form. Anytime he's seeing you, he's seeing you half-hearted. He's seeing you half-hearted. Oh no, sorry, half-healthy. 
trying to manage something, he's trying to manage a lot. So why can't he just sit and read, rather, rather be an elder statement? If Ali Bongo has, has listened to his health, listened to his inner mind, he would have stepped down. Okay, if you even manage, if the, if the Gabonese people were foolish enough to allow you with your ill health, with your, with your, with, with your shaky shaky movement, to rule them from 2018 to 2023, Okay, you came back second time in 2016 and there was riots in town. People were angry, people burned down houses. They did a lot of uh, demonstration to say, we don't want you, we don't like you, we didn't vote you. Okay, then people started cursing you because people didn't like you. They started praying negative, they, started, they didn't pray for you. Then you ran into stroke in 2018, 2017, 2018. Okay, you have how many years more? Five years. 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, five years. Then after five years, what will have make you? What won't, why won't you just say, oh, let me put another candidate out in my party. And if the candidate win, so be it. If he didn't win, then let the opposition win. Then I will beg them, my ill health, I will beg them to not to probe me or I will do plea bargaining with them. But you are so greedy. You, 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 lock, that, you lock out the foreign observers because you're a thief, you're a rogue. I'm sorry, this is without prejudice. You, 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 you close the internet. You know how many business you have killed so that people will not be able to do their business because you want to put yourself in power. You want to put yourself back in power by force, by fire, by thunder. Then you try to gag the press. Then you even try to gag the citizen. But look at what happened now. Now, the same idiot you that closed down the, the, the media close down the social media, you are not coming to, to offer a plea in your parlor, begging people to make noise, and using the same social media to beg people across the world. If only you knew that people are just making jests of you and laughing at you. You are now a laughing stock across the country, across the world, a laughing stock. Because you didn't do it well, you didn't give a good legacy, and it's going to haunt your children. Go to, go to Kampala. Go to Uganda and ha ask how it feels for anybody to say I'm a son or a daughter of Idi Amin, late Idi Amin. Yes, you might get respect in some quarters, but in large majority, larger majority, it's going to be looked down with, uh, uh, with disdain. They're going to look him or look her critically and say, oh, your father was Idi Amin. Or you go anywhere, you say you're a son of Samuel Do, even in Monrovia. People will still look at you critically and say, oh, your father was Samuel Do. Actually, you will need to, 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 to do a lot of whitewashing, <laughs> a lot of image laundering. So the Bongo family are not leaving a good legacy. They didn't leave a good legacy. Even a few hours after the father was arrested, was locked out of his presidency, the son was caught with, allegedly caught with billions of pound sterling, all sort of assorted foreign currencies. And they are charging that one for treason. And that is how the trend of these power brokers behave. The other day, the son of one of them in Nigeria was even skating on the city, in the city with security people behind him. This same boy was the one that we caught on the, on the, on the, on the picture, drawing the, the, the beard, the beard of a king. You can imagine how the Yorubas revived the traditional institution. And because your father is so rich and so influential, you can play with the beard of a king. And these are the kind of sedu seductive impunity, seductive impunity that they bring into power. And they put it at your face that there's nothing you can do. Because they feel that they can buy your conscience, buy your courage, buy your personality, buy your individuality. And nobody is doing critical thinking. Nobody is doing critical analysis. Nobody is saying anything. Everybody is just looking. And look at what happened, the ripple effect of Gabon on Cameroon. The old man that's supposed to have been swept out of power long ago, supposed to be picked out. This is a man that went to a conference and they gave him a, a book. They gave him his, his, his thesis to read. They gave him his uh, uh, papers to read. And he was asking them, where am I? That is Paul Bia. They were telling sir, you are in the front of a lot of people. And he was asking them, are there important people here? They say, yes, sir. Congressmen from US, from all over the world. He said, eh, you would have told me. And the next thing he was farting. He farted three times. 
That means his health is not at par with him. His health is not cooperating with him. His senses is not cooperating with him. His cognitive knowledge is down. And he was shamed out of that event because he couldn't present anything. And they took him back to Cameroon. Maybe he has used voodoo to capture the, 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 the soldiers, the military in Cameroon. And recently now, he was so afraid, he retired a lot of top ranking officers in the army. The same thing with Paul, uh, with Paul Kagame, the, the two Paul, Paul Bia, Paul Kagame. Paul, Paul Kagame did well for, Uganda, for Rwanda. He has, you have built a beautiful country. But learn from people like Gaddafi. If you build a beautiful country, then you, you rule for a good time, then you step out of power. Then you, you, you can engineer your own succession. But when you, you want to be in power forever, one day people will be tired. When President uh, Mandela, Nelson Mandela came from prison after 27 years, he was a lovable leader. South Africa voted for him, he was in power. And he did power four years. He had every opportunity, every goodwill in the world to go for a second term. If care is not even taken, he could have even pushed for a third term. But at least he was eligible for a second term. But he said, no, I have been able to put in institutions in places. I put in schedules in places. I put in good legacy in place. Let another person take over. And you saw what happened. He, he was able to leave a legacy. Even the next guy that took over in Tabo Mbeki was able to take out of that that leadership knowledge. And when there was crisis in the party, the ANC, he left power, except for the other man, the Zuma, that messed up the legacy of Mandela in South Africa. And he's serving his jail term. He has gone to jail severally now. He paid back. Thank God for Siri Ramaphosa, who is now doing well too there, who is trying to, to rebuild that legacy. So, in the case of Gabon, this is what happened to dictators. This is what happened to very greedy people, greedy politicians who want to have everything to themselves. They want to be governor, they want to be senator, they want to be president, even by fire, by thunder. They want to be everything that God did assign them to become. And you keep wondering, what kind of life is this? So when you look at how that man is shouting in his, in his city room that he need noise, that he need noise, yes, everybody will give you the noise, but this part of the noise, and the noise I'm going to give you, Alibongo, is that you should go back to God, see for forgiveness, find a good therapeutic expert to even in that video you see his hand is still curved. Or where it bad no, it was just managing that hand. <laughs> so the stroke was still on him. He, 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 he couldn't stretch his hand very well. It was just it was he, you could see that it was not free. His health was not free. His hand was his hand, his right hand was curved as a result of the massive stroke. He can't walk straight. So if they say you should even do it, man, okay, if he goes to any country and they're doing a brigade, military brigade, we just be, we, they have to aid him to walk. They have to push him. He, because it's not well. Yet he wants to control over two million fitted people in Gabon. There are a lot of fitted intellectuals with good health, but we will not allow them to stay on that seat because it's a greedy, greedy, greedy lot. And, and I'm sure on the last note that you will, will have seen the other side of elitism. For our politicians home here, elitism is the only thing that will lock you out of reality. You are in Abuja, you drive the best of the cars, you fly, you, you drive from your car to your helicopter to your private jet, then the people are suffering, they can't buy a Derika of rice cheaply, they can't buy a Congo of Gary cheaply, they can't buy Rodo, Tomato, Tatashi, Albosa, they can't even buy soup ingredient cheaply. And every day they wake up and they lay courses on you. And you think that those courses will not work, that you should go to hell. Well, time will tell. Time will tell very soon. Very soon. And when it happens, you will see people jubilate the way they jubilated in Gabon. You will see people jubilate the way they jubilated in the army. You see people jubilate the way they jubilated in Burkina Faso. You see people jubilate the way they jubilated in Mali. You see people jubilate the way they jubilated in Chad. You see people jubilate the way they jubilated in Kini Kona Cry. It is a new turn of revolution. It's what we call behavioral science, behavioral revolution. 
be Havoria Revolution. People are saying no because they look in between the line, they look and they saw and they believe that you cannot give them what they need. Well, I want to thank you for listening. The discourse will continue shortly. We have just spoken about Ali Bongo. We we'll look at what is going to happen in Gabon in a few months. Then we we'll look at what is happening in other countries. I just think I needed to come out and talk on this. We have other issues I'm going to discuss. Please kindly continue to watch Asabi Africa TV on our analysis table. We we'll bring in more issues and we we'll discuss them. We we'll discuss them honestly. And if there's anything you feel about what we said, you can put your comments in the comment box. You can share your opinion. What do you know about Gabon? What do you know about Omar Bongo? What do you know about Ali Bongo? And what do you feel about our politician in Nigeria? Yes, everybody's angry. Every day you see them on TV, you just feel so bad. You see them talk. The other one, they brought him as a minister. Recently in Abuja, he was talking about breaking people's houses. He was not even talking about something creative. He's not talking about something innovative. He's talking about blah, 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 blah. he's going to do this. He's going to... Did they say that you they, 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 okay? Why you why you brought to power because of vendetta to come and deal with people? And if you deal with people, we will deal with you because one day, one day you will be on the streets like any other person, and that is when you will know how how crazy it is that power can intoxicate. Power can intoxicate you just like a beer. If you take a bottle of beer or gin, you will be intoxicated. But after that intoxication, reality sets in. When you are on the streets after maximum four years, then people will ask you questions. People will, people will say things that will make you feel so bad about yourself. So everybody should learn from Umar Bongo and Ali Bongo and the Bongo dynasty. There is karma, there is justice. Thank you. God bless you. Goodbye.